You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast Network. You're listening to the DolphinsTalk.com Podcast, the most listened to daily Miami Dolphins podcast on the internet. Come on, Dolphins fans. Time to fins up. Good evening, Miami Dolphins fans. How are you today? And thank you for listening to the DolphinsTalk.com podcast. On this Monday, March the 18th, I'm your host, Michael Leva, joined by Tom Ernesty from right here at DolphinsTalk.com. Tom, how are you doing tonight? I'd be better if the weather was a little bit nicer where we are, back to freezing, back to some snow, but uh, we're here to talk some Dolphins football, not the stupid weather we're having. Yeah, and a um, little bit of a busy day on Monday. You had a couple signings there with the offensive line we're going to break that down and also talk about where sort of miami's offensive line stands as of today because with these two signings i don't know how many more signings there's going to be on this offensive line here between now and training camp and maybe we had someone in the draft or two but we're going to talk about that and take a big picture approach here with how miami is building their offensive line but before we get to any of that as always a big shout out to everyone listening at finheaven.com everyone go to finheaven.com the largest miami dolphins message board on the internet. Also, a shout out to our friends at the I Am a Miami Dolphins fan Facebook page, run by the great and talented Carlos Hernandez. If you're on Facebook, please be sure you are part of the I Am a Miami Dolphins fan Facebook page. And wherever you're listening to this podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Audible, Podbean, Podchase, or on all the platforms, hit the subscribe button. We've had shows each and every day of the week through this free agency period that will continue as long as Miami's still making moves. And there's news to talk about. And once we, you know, start to move towards the draft, we're going to have shows again each and every day in the lead up to the draft is Miami actually has a couple picks this year in rounds one and two. So there's going to be a lot to talk about there. You don't want to miss an episode. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Also, I know we have a lot of listeners, Tom, that are men. And this is an important week for men. So because this is the week where the most men in America get their vasectomies. Why? Because they want to sit home for March Madness and take a few days off of work with an ice pack on their nuts and not do anything. So for any men out there who listen to this podcast, and if you're getting a vasectomy this week, good luck. Because it's like, <laughs> I saw the stat today, Tom. It is an insane number of men who are having this done. So I'm guessing at least one or two or like 10 have to be listeners of our podcast. So if you're a DolphinsTalk.com listener who has their vasectomy scheduled for the middle or end of this week, <laughs> good luck. Hope it all goes well. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's brilliant. Let's be honest. It's brilliant that you're taking the opening round of the NCAA basketball tournament in March uh, to do this. God bless you. I mean, that's. got to be smart about it. It's all about planning. You have to be smart about it. So everyone will have their brackets, a nice pack, maybe a couple of nice cold beverages, and you get to enjoy some magic. control, some fresh batteries. That's all you need. Right. <laughs> um, and, then, and, then, and then also have your app and bet all the games. And, you you know, yes, you're in a little pain, but you can have a little fun too and, t- and take a few days off work. So good luck yeah. to anyone having that this week. Uh, on a serious note, uh, let's talk about the first signing of the day. The Dolphins re-signed Isaiah Wynn, who was a starting left guard last year until he got hurt to a one-year deal. Terms weren't disclosed, but it's cheap because Isaiah Wynn is someone who, let's just call it what is, was a first-round bust with the Patriots, came to Miami last year, started at left guard, was okay, wasn't awful, wasn't great, was okay, played seven games, so he got hurt on Sunday night versus the Eagles, and then with a quad injury, and then he missed the remainder of the year. The problem with Isaiah Wynn is this guy makes Teron Armstead look like Cal Ripken, the Iron Man. I mean, he misses more games than Armstead, and he has all throughout his career, so when he's on the field, which is rare, um, you know, he wasn't bad last year for Miami. And I just, I don't mind the signing because again, it's not a lot of money I'm guessing. And 
they need capable offensive linemen. And, I, and, you know, he's capable when he plays, or at least he showed that last year. It's just if Isaiah Wynn is starting week one for the Dolphins at left guard, then I would say something has gone terribly wrong this offseason. Um, and I know Chris Greer always, well, he said last year, you know, quote, unquote, you're more worried about the offensive line than we are. Well, it's like signings like this that, you know, <laughs> have me convinced he truly believes that. So I guess, Tom, what's your first thought here with this Isaiah Wynn signing and that they're bringing him back into the fold in 2024? Uh, I, it makes sense. Number one, he's cheap, right? He's coming off an injury. He's not going to cost a ton on the cap. I'm sure it's an incentive laden contract. Number two, it doesn't mess with a comp pick formula for that seventh round pick that we currently have, uh, with, uh, Deshaun Elliott. Elliott. So yep. again, nothing that's going to hurt any of the future for the dolphins in 2025. And number three, he was he was solid last year, especially as a road grader. When the Dolphins were at their peak of the run game, he was in he was in the starting lineup. After he left, I mean the run game was still good, but it did lose a little bit of its luster from the beginning of the year. Um, as a pass protector, there's a reason why he didn't work out a tackle, and the Dolphins put him at guard. Um, again. It's a signing that's not overly bad. I don't think it's overly great. I don't feel like running it back with the same unit is a great idea. Um, I know they added Brewer at center, which I felt was a good signing. Um, but if you're telling me the other potential four, and yes, it includes Liam Meikenberg, potentially penciled in at right guard, uh, I am worried. And... I, I and we're going to get to that in a minute. They're not more about like they're done, but overall yeah. win, okay of a signing. Yeah, um, you know, there's sometimes where change for the sake of change isn't needed, and there's time where change for the sake of change kind of is needed. I felt that when it came to Braxton Barrios, so I'm like, you know, not awful, not great, right. but is there anyone else out there who might have a little bit higher of an upside? Kind of feel that way about this signing. It's like, not awful, not great. Again, it's a one-year deal for little money. I get it. Um, but again, you know, there's not like a ton of guys out there. I mean, there are guys out there on signing still, yes. Are they anything mean, that's going to like move the needle or get you excited? Eh, probably not. But it's Isaiah Wynn. Um, if he come, and, and again, if he is the backup left guard, right guard, and maybe a backup tackle, it's like, all right. But I got to look again when Chris Greer says this stuff. I know most fans, oh, he doesn't really mean no, he kind of really means it. And if you know Isaiah Wynn is penciled in as their starting left guard, and they're like, well, if we get someone in the draft who beats him out in camp, great. If not, well, we got Win. It's like that, that's what scares me here. And kind of leads into the next signing where the Dolphins signed uh, Jack Driscoll from Philadelphia, 2024 20, round pick from the Eagles. Um, since 2020. Played in 54 games, only started 17, uh, started one last year, ended the 2020 season on IR, and the 20, uh, in 2021 he had two stints on IR. I'm guessing this is the replacement for Kendall Lamb. I mean, I might be wrong. I don't know. Which, okay, I mean, Lamb showed you a little bit more last year, I thought, to uh, yeah. try to move on from him. Um, but he still might be back. I don't know. And if they do resign Lamb, then this signing is even more confusing as he brought into uh, – help replace Robert Hunt, then you have to start thinking because he can also play some guard. You know, this signing to me screams a lot of last year when we signed, signed Mr. Feeney, Dan Feeney, or when we signed Matt Skura, who, you know, at the time, it's like, okay, this guy, you know, he's not bad. He can do a little tap. And neither one of those guys made out of camp. So it's like this one, again, I'm sure it's for very little money, so it's like, why get all worked up? It's not that I'm worked up about the actual signing. It's just, you know, as you said, Austin Jackson's back. Liam Eikenberg is back. Um, we went from Connor Williams to Aaron Brewer, which is, you know, on paper, fine. But in reality, a little bit of a downgrade. Um, Isaiah Wynn, Tron Armstead. Now you sign this guy here. You got Lester Cotton. You got Robert Jones. It seems to me, we're, I mean, I don't know how many more guys you're going to have here. Maybe you had someone in the draft. Absolutely. Maybe sign like an offensive tackle in round one or two, and he's your left tackle of the future. Maybe he plays one of your guard. I get that. But 
I don't think we're signing too many more guys. I think we're going to run it back with essentially you know, the same offensive line we had last year. And, you know, sorry if on March 18th it's got me a little concerned, Tom. Am I nuts to be a little concerned about that? No, I don't think you're nuts. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the praise last year was there wasn't significant drop off when some of these guys went down, obviously when Connor Williams went down and that was a massive drop off. Um, but I mean, I thought, you know, praise for Butch Berry to get the most out of the guys he had. Obviously Austin Jackson was the big turnaround story from last year. Um, but the, a lot of the O-line issues were masked because the quarterback got rid of the ball so damn quick on every single drop back. Um, I think he averaged for the season right around like 2.2 in change for released from snap to release. Uh, I wish that they would address the offensive line to the point where pass protection allows him to move through his progressions at not lightning speed. I mean, I'm thankful that he can do that, but can it be a little bit better? Yes. Um, but yes, I would be a little concerned. I mean, I'm fully on board if they decide at 21 that if there's a guy there like Fontenot who can play guard or tackle, if that's a guy they want starting at left guard and have Isaiah win as a backup, I'm all for it. Uh, if they like the guy, uh, Graham Barton from Duke, if they like him, go for it. Um, but they can't continue to stand pat. I know they're going to get a buttload of money buttload of money, meaning $18.5 million after June 1st, where they could potentially swing a trade uh, for somebody that might have fallen out of favor with a team going into camp or during camp and preseason games. They can go after somebody if they get an injury for one of their depth players, whatever else. Um, I don't want them to be done. I don't feel like there is a major move that is on the market at this point that could – Wow, you, they're set at tackle. They want Austin Jackson at right tackle, clearly based on his contract that he signed last year. Teron Armstead is back. He signed up. So your tackle spots are done. Brewer signed to be your center. That spot is done. It's the guard positions at this point that are worrisome. I don't want Liam Eichenberg starting, but at the, but at the same time, the amount of experience he's had at every single position on the offensive line is rare to find. I think they still need an upgrade o- over him where you lose Robert Hunt, who again was was good football player, clearly was paid like one uh, by the Panthers, but that was the Panther. I don't understand that contract, but he, he deserves it, right? He deserves oh, it. I understand it. They screwed up to pick a quarterback, and now they're going to build a wall in front of that kid to try and salvage the pick. Correct. That's all it is. So. Correct. So I don't want them to be done. I feel like whether it's – the first round draft pick or the second round draft pick, they're going to address the offensive line. I'm still team trade down, but you know, we'll save draft talk for another day, but they need to address the offensive line. They need someone young who is ready to supplant Armstead at left tackle. If they decide to go tackle route, if they draft a guy that can play guard and tackle remind you of Laramie Tunsil, right? But Tunsil never played guard, but he was a very good guard in 2016 uh, for this football team playing next to Brandon Albert. So I don't feel like they need to, they should be done, but at this point of free agency, there's not going to be any big moves left in the tank for the Dolphins, especially where they sit with the compensatory picks. One name I also forgot to mention who I know they like a lot is Keon Smith, who actually might be the replacement for Lamb in reality um, and yeah. be that first offensive tackle off the bench at left tackle, right tackle. And I'm not saying – it's right. I'm not saying I agree, but they actually might view him as a long-term answer for Armstead if yep. he continues to develop in some ways. Um, I don't know. I think he has a lower ceiling. But again, when it comes to offensive line, I think the fan base has a pretty much a collective vision. And Chris Greer, his vision's rapidly different, drastically different than what, than what everyone else sees. Um, yep. So what he might see is something we don't. But yeah, I mean, overall, again, when you factor in Smith and Driscoll and to me, and it just it leads you to think that they felt last year, and this sort of leads into our next conversation with this lineup overall, they felt 
last year, the team was good enough to win. And, um, you know, yes, they lost Wilkins. Yes, they lost Hunt. But aside from that, in my eyes, pretty much the same roster. You know, you swapped out, um, you swapped out Andrew Van Ginkle and Jerome Baker, bring in Brooks and Shaq Barrett. That's a lateral swap out. You want to say it's a slight upgrade? Fine, but it's nothing more than a slight upgrade. It's pretty much a wash. You lose, um, you lose Howard, Elliott, and Jones. You bring in Jordan Poyer and Kendall Fuller. Again, that's pretty much a wash in my opinion. You want to say a slight upgrade? Go for it. It's a wash in my opinion. You they did upgrade tight end, so that's an upgrade. But yeah. they took a step back at center. I mean, not a big step back, but it's a it's a small step back at center. So kind of like that's a wash there. Same group of quarterbacks. They're going to keep the same group of running backs. Your top two wide receivers are there. They have to fill out the rest, but they got the same top two wide receivers. That's pretty much the same. The two losses that they – and they signed <laughs> – they lost Wilkins and signed five career backups, which – well, they lost Wilkins and Raekwon, and they signed five career backups, which makes me think just how everything's sort of coming to play. The team's kind of set. I mean, yeah, they're going to add a guy like here. They'll probably sign a wide receiver. Like there was a report yesterday about that Quez Watkins guy. They'll sign someone like that, if not him, someone like that. And they're going to probably add someone else um, on the front three, or they might add like another edge rusher, but nothing that's going to move the needle again. I think they're pretty much swapped out most of these guys, and yeah. they're looking for the replacements for Hunt, Wilkins, in the draft. And that's pretty much your 2024 Dolphins are like, yeah, lost two linebackers, added two. We think that we're like a little bit better there. Lost some guys in secondary, replaced them with two. We think we're a little bit better there. Found a tight end, took a step back at center, and we're going to replace Wilkinson Hunt in the draft. And that's our 2024 Dolphins. To me, as we sit here on March 18th, that's kind of where this team is headed. And I'm not saying it's wrong. And the team did win 11 games last year. I'm not even saying it's bad. But I think if got, I think if fans are out there waiting for like this mega trade or this mega signing, I don't think it's coming. I think this is the team. And we'll see what they add in the draft. Um, the only thing with the draft is, is if they add an offensive lineman, what we've learned with kind of Chris Greer picks with the offensive line, Austin Jackson took the, took the round four to quote-unquote get good. Liam Meikenberg took the last year, which was year three for him, to not even get good, just be like serviceable and not stink. Um, Robert Hunt was, was like year two-ish when, you know, he struggled a lot year one. Year two, he was fine enough. So, like any rookie offensive lineman they sign, if you're expecting them to just come in the lineup and start right away and contribute, that's wishful thinking. It might be, it might be a 2025 deal. But I think this is the team. And it's not a bad team. There's a lot of talent on this team. you got a Hall of Famer in Hill. you got a Hall of Famer in Ramsey. you got Armstead, who when he's healthy and on the field, is one of the best left tackles. you got um, some running backs who are coming off productive years. I worry about their injuries. But when they're healthy on the field, they can produce. There's talent there. Austin Jackson's coming off a great year. The Chubb and Jalen Phillips thing's a little concerning, but, you know, is what it is. Nothing can do about it. In the secondary, I like the secondary. So it's not like a bad team, but I don't think there's, like, a big move still coming in free agency or trade. And I think we kind of know what the 2024 Dolphins are, short of a couple depth signings the rest of the way. Would you agree or, or am I wrong? I wouldn't say you're wrong. I still think there's a lot of time to figure out how this is actually going to round out in regards of the roster from an offensive standpoint, you got to fill in for uh, wide receivers. I mean, there to me, you know, when looking at it, you have Hill and Waddle, which enough said there. However, you have to have a, a third option at wide receiver because that's going to alleviate some of the stress that Hill and Waddle have to go through each and every game when you have defenses, you know, keying in on those two guys and, and two of obviously from a volume perspective through to Hill and Waddle far, far more than any other player on offense. So having a third option that could alleviate some of the stress just opens up more things for Mike McDaniel to do offensively on the defensive side of the ball. We don't know what Anthony Weaver is going to bring to the table just yet. You know, obviously there's talk of running three safeties, uh, as they did in Baltimore. But we don't know yet. You know, I, I think if, and it's a big if, obviously based on the report this weekend from uh, Chris Perkins, is if you get Jalen Phillips 
in the lineup for week one, that's a breath of fresh air compared to what we've expected in regards of injury for him and how long it could take for him to come back. Um, but having Jalen Phillips on the field with across from Shaq Barrett, I like that. Obviously having Bradley Chubb would be a lot nicer, but it's going to take some time to recover from that ACL. I know he targets that he wants to be back at the beginning of the year, but it's going to take time. Also, you got to stop the run. Are these guys that they have up front on the defensive line able to do the things as I've been saying on, on social media, it's like a money ball scenario, right? You have Christian Wilkins, very, very talented football player, no longer with us. How do you do it? You replace him with four to five different guys that might be able to produce to some level. They're not going to individually produce to Christian Wilkins numbers, but if there's a rotation that happens, are they capable enough of being able to stop the run, applying some pressure to the quarterback again? We don't know. It's a bunch of guys right now that have played, obviously started some games in this league, but have been mostly career backups. Defensive line is something that has to be addressed, possibly in the draft. But you don't have enough picks to do these things, which is why I'm team trade down. Again, story for another day. Um, but I wouldn't hit the panic button just yet. If they are nobody's hitting the panic button. That's the no, thing. But if, if like... they're running it, if they're kind of running it back. That's kind of what they're doing. It, if that's the case, I'm not worried from an offensive uh, standpoint. They were number one in the league last year. I'm not worried about that. My concern right now is how it's going to look defensively on the defensive line. How are the linebackers going to be? Secondary, I feel more comfortable now that Kendall Fuller is in the building than having an unknown like Cam Smith out there playing or having you know Kater Kohu, who I like, he was not good last year, especially because he was put on an island a lot by Vic Fangio. So a lot has to be done. I think there's plenty of time from a defensive st- uh, standpoint to see where this is going to go. Offense, I'm okay with. For If they're running it back that way, I'm fine. McDaniel's a very smart guy. He knows what he's doing on the offensive side of the ball. The question marks for me is on defense. Yeah, um, and I will say this too on defense. You know, to me, and we talk about the needs, you know, we always take the temperature of the needs after, you know, first week of free. First, we talk about the needs right when the season ends. Then we talk about it sort of after they make some cuts. Then we talk about it last week after the first wave of moves. Then we talk about it here today with some other moves. Um, I think right now as we sit today, there's only three ways to go in rounds one or two. That is, you know, offensive line, clearly, if you want to go like offensive tackle, I don't see them taking a center guard in round one just because we know how much Chris Greer loves that fifth-year option. I don't think he wants to waste it on a center guard. Offensive tackle who plays one-year guard, absolutely, um, but not center guard. That, that's just me. But even if they did, that's fine. Um, some sort of offensive lineman in rounds one or two. The other two spots, wide receiver, which I sort of spoke about on last night's show, there's two types of Dolphins fans. Fans who know wide receivers in need and the fans that are clueless. Why is it in need? Because Waddle, his contract's coming up, and we just lived this with Christian Wilkins. And, you know, everyone can throw all the flowers they want at Chris Greer. Clearly, drafting the players, he's done pretty well the past few years. Retaining guys is still an issue, and I don't have a lot of faith in him being able to retain them. And the other guy in Tyreek, whether it's at a comedy show, whether it's a plus-size model, whether it's smashing a cigar in someone's face, whether it's paternity suit after paternity suit after paternity suit, whether something at a marina is, is in the headlines every week, and you need dummy insurance for this guy at this point because the next one might be the one that actually gets him suspended. So, yeah, wide re- and plus you just need a third wide receiver in general because last year when those guys were less than 100%, the offense came to a stop. Yeah. So those are the three spots they need, wide receiver, offensive line, and defensive line. And I would – if you're trying to win a Super Bowl in 2024 – you can make the case that pick 21, pick 55, if they just sit put, don't make any trades, go defensive line and defensive line, double down, get two guys in there who hopefully you know can come in and, and contribute some way right away, and then in 2025 maybe be more of a polished product to replace Wilkins and Raekwon, put with Zach Sealer, and then in 2025 you're going to have you know Chubb healthy, you're going to have Jalen Phillips healthy, 
and you're going to have Brooks and you, you know, Long, I think would still be, I mean, that's a pretty good group for 2025, but also in 2024, let's get the groundwork going. I'm building up the trenches, at least on one of these sides of the ball and going double down there at that side of the ball would go a long way in sort of fixing your trench problem, at least on defense. And then an offense, you know, maybe patchwork it for a year, like it apparently, like it appears they might be. And, you know, worry about that another day, maybe yeah. like next year when you get all these extra comp picks. Um, I don't know. But would you be against them going defensive line and defensive line round one, round two of this draft? If they don't trade down, if they just sit where they are. I'm not opposed to it. It just depends on who's there. Um, I, I, there there's enough talent in this draft offensively where you could wait on a wide receiver till like round five. Um, yep. But if – after all these signings on the defensive line to fill spots, obviously some are going to be camp bodies. Not every, every player they, they brought in for free agency is going to get a roster spot um, because a lot of these guys are signing one year contracts on cheap money um, and they're going to fight for jobs. I'm not opposed if, if, if they go defensive line, defensive line, but if they go defensive line, defensive line, <coughs> I would not mind an edge rusher. And I would definitely would not mind a defensive tackle, but I don't know if they go defensive. One of them has to be a tackle. One of them hundred percent has to be a defensive tackle, but I'm hundred percent on board. If one of them is an edge rusher, like, you know, chop Robinson, for instance, if he's there at 21 and that's the guy you want, go get him. Uh, or um, the kid from UCLA. Yeah. Him. Latu, yeah. Latu, whatever. Latu, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that that's another kid that I would not mind having in the fold at 21. He seems like a career guy. Got a little bit of an injury history, can play really well when he's healthy. He, that pick screams Chris Greer, actually, right there. It totally yeah. screams Chris Greer. It just does. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, I we all have followed this guy enough at this point where you can be like, that's a Chris Greer guy. You can just, that's a Chris Greer guy. He like, he's good, got a little bit of an injury problem, so he's going to see some value in him. He's got, you know, the, that's a guy that, you know, you can sort of yeah. know the – if a guy's super, super fast, that's a Chris Greer guy. Guy's got a little bit of a, some sort of injury, that's a Chris Greer guy. If some guy can play, you know, center, guard, guard, tackle, that's a Chris Greer guy. Like, you know Chris Greer, what he's looking for with these traits. Um, it don't always work, but sometimes it does, yeah. just whatever. But, yeah, I think with the wide receiver, what's interesting is if it's not Brian Thomas Jr., because here's the deal. You're going to get three going off the board really quick. You're going to get um, Harrison, I think his name is Neighbors, and you got yep. the other guy, Ozawa, whatever his name is. I can't From Washington, yet. yep. Yeah, they, those three are going to go flying. Then that Brian Thomas is like – then you got like the Jacksonville and the Saints who might be in on him. Um, so I don't know if he's going to make it to 21. But if it's Thomas, everything I just said about the beef on the line, throw it out the window, give me that kid. Because that, that kid just looks like Justin Jefferson. <laughs> I don't know why he just does. I know they both went down. He just looks like him, and I think he's going to be a star just from watching him play. Uh, get him. But if it's not him, there's like another seven or eight guys that are like kind of all the same, like yeah. Troy Franklin types. Um, we've got a little speed. you got the kid from Georgia who doesn't have the speed but like can run the most precise routes ever. And I just think you pair him with someone like Tua – you know, it's like a match made in heaven. Like, I'm going to put the ball there. I'll be there. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like those two guys would probably just become like peas and carrots. But there's like four or five guys that like I can wait to 55 and hope one falls there. So I really do think round one, it's about getting stronger at at least one of the sides of the trenches. Um, yeah. That's just, that's where they need it. And we'll see the wide receiver like that. Quez Watkins guy it wouldn't be the top of my list, but if they signed a guy like that. That's going to give him some breathing room um, to not, you know, feel pressure to take one early. I would say. Yeah, and I think a lot of the signings that we've seen recently kind of alleviates a little pressure. Um, you know, for me, especially when you're in this position of, you know, win now. I'm taking best player available. I don't care about position. If it falls out that it's a defensive lineman, take the player. If it is it, what I mean by best player available on your draft board, if that guy is available and he's the top guy that's available on your draft board, you take him. If it's a wide receiver at 21 and it's deep wide receiver class, again, part of me wanting to trade down is you're 
get some picks in round maybe three, four, so you can address more needs later on in the draft. And if a wide receiver is sitting there and you don't get anybody else, you just re-sign Braxton Berrios, who wide receiver four or five, he's a punt returner, kick returner. You still need a wide receiver three. And like you said, Mike, and I 100% agree, I feel like at this stage you should be talking to Jalen Waddle about a contract. you got to pick up his fifth-year option. That's a no-brainer decision. But he he might take the Christian Wilkins route. Obviously, Wilkins bet on himself. Dolphins probably talked to him about a few contracts over his time in Miami, and he declined, declined, declined. He got a massive bag. The wide receiver market, if Kelvin Ridley at the age of 30 is getting $24, $25 million, what's Jalen Waddle worth? at the age of 24, 25 years old right now. you got to forward think about these things. Tyreek Hill is going to eventually retire over the next two years. No, he they ain't going to retire. He ain't re- That's all bullshit. Um, <laughs> folks, I am sorry for swearing. He ain't retiring. That's all. First no. off, if anyone listens to anything Tyreek Hill says and takes it seriously, you're a moron. He just yeah. says stuff. I'm going to be a porn okay. star. I'm going to be a porn star. But, I'm going to do it. He, it's just he ain't retiring, but he ain't going to be in Miami because they haven't restructured his deal. And after the headline that came out yesterday, and be, probably because now Miami sees how much it will cost to keep Waddle, the Dolphins are smart. Like, we can't be tied into this lunatic, and we got probably him gone at around the same time. We really have to pay Waddle, worst case scenario. I think Waddle's going to get the bag from Miami. I'm not sure about guys like Holland or Phillips, but I think Tyreek, they're letting him play this out. Not going to read and then when his contract expires, it's going to be, bye. Thanks for the memories. Well, yeah, and, and my thought of retiring, meaning his contract's going to run out with Miami, and I think it's a done deal. I think either he rides off to the sunset and does what he wants to do after football, or he does sign somewhere else, whatever he decides to do. But you got to have a plan in place. And this, to me, feels like a draft with the amount of explosive wide receivers you got to think about taking one. I'm not saying you have to take one, but you got to think about it. Whether it's pick one in round one or you wait till round two, there's still plenty of talent available in the second round at that position if you don't address the need right now. you got to think about doing it. Waddle's going to cost a ton of money. Tyreek Hill already cost a ton of money. Getting, getting a wide receiver in the draft with your first or second pick is going to cost you a lot less than going out there and trying to find someone in the free agent market. Whether it's this year or next year, it's going to be cheaper. I feel this is the draft you do it. I like a lot of the wide receivers, and when I am starting to do my mock drafts, you're, you're going to read about wide receivers, believe me. Yeah, and plus the other factor is this is a wide receiver-based offense. Don't let anybody lie to you and fool you and how now all of a sudden now we're going to start using tight ends because in year three, tight ends. You, Mike, Mc, Mike McDaniel's never had his own offense before, so when he says that, it's just, once again, and plus with him, it's kind of like Tyreek when he says stuff it, because he never follows through on any of this stuff. You know, he always says, we're going to run the ball more. Well, he doesn't. He goes, I'm going to stop throwing that, that, that fade pass in the end zone. Well, he does. Like, so, so when he says stuff, I don't even – it's just in one ear, out the other, because he just he never follows through on anything he says. Uh, this is a wide receiver offense. It's heavy wide receiver-based yep. offense. So I want depth at wide receiver, so it's not a house of cards where if one guy gets hurt or one guy's out, one guy has to miss a month or one guy's playing at less than 100%, the whole thing falls apart like it did at the end of last year. You want to keep replenishing the most one of the most important spots on your roster, and on this roster with this offense, it's wide receiver. I... Uh, I mean, I love – there's uh, like a handful of guys in this wide receiver class I love. Um, I don't know if they're going to do it, though, because I think they're still struggling in how to replace Hunt and Wilkins and even Raekwon on some level. And I think they just need size on the on the line of scrimmage. But, yeah, um, we're probably going to get into some early round mocks. I was thinking – because I know you and me, right before the draft, we do the draft where we go back and forth like every other pick type deal. We should probably have that because now it's been a few years since Miami's actually had a pick in round one or two. Um, or they had a pick last year in round two, but that was pretty much it. Um, 
we should probably have a couple of those this year. It, yeah. In the lead ups, like a big final one, we should do that a couple times. I think it might be good. Have one like now, super super early. Have one like first part of April, then do one at the end of April, just to see how it changes and uh, where we are with those. I will say this too here as I wrap up. Not having a third round pick for tampering really stinks this year. Yeah. This team needs a third round pick in the worst way. You know, the whole thing for tampering, here's the deal. I was never mad at the punishment because much as Raw fans, the Dolphins, their ass was guilty and they got caught. So I can't get mad at the punishment. And losing, you know, the picks early, it stinks. But the fact that we are like a few years removed from this now and we're still being, we've still got now a third round pick that we lost. It's like, really? This, because we kind of really need it this year. We need a bad and we don't have it. And then you factor the, pick we traded for Chubb in round four we ain't got that either it's like man they really need picks um they do in 2025 (laughs) yeah 2025 they're they're gonna be flush with them which makes me think they might be a little aggressive this year like round one or I don't know I don't think they'll trade out around one I'd be careful trading too far down though I still want a very good player to come in right away you can somewhat help yeah. Um, and I just always I go back to the year we were picking like 12th or so, and we had Earl Thomas fall in our lap. And coming out of college, Earl Thomas was like a beast, and everyone knew he was gonna be good, he was gonna be good right away. And we traded down and ended up with Jared Odrick and his Pee Wee Herman dance, which he was a nice player, don't get me wrong. But you can get Jared guys like Jared Odrick, and all we also got was Koamisi. You know, once again, nice players, but not game changers like Earl Thomas. You have Earl Thomas on your team. You got a big time, you know, for a span of about five years, he was like one of the best safeties in the league, and we just got two guys. So sometimes trading down, yeah, I get why, but you don't want to trade down to the point where you go from getting like a game changer or someone you think could be a game changer day one um, to just getting a couple bodies. Like, Adric and Missy were nice, but they ever, like, you can get those guys anywhere. Um, So... I want to see who's on the board before we trade down, who's there, and if it makes sense. But I'd rather trade down around two than trade down around one. Let me just say it that way. I'd rather trade down at 55, go down 10, 15 spots, and pick up a pick around four than actually trade down from pick 21. Because I think at pick 21, with possibly five quarterbacks going before our pick, that means we're going to get like a top 15 position player roughly. Roughly. Because I think it's going to go quarterback, 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 J.J. McCarthy's going to go like five, six, or seven, and I think some team's going to do something stupid and take like Knicks before our pick. And, I mean, even if they don't, and it goes four quarterbacks in the top 21, that means we're getting like a top 17 player. And there's like a really good play. And then if you factor the top three wide receivers who are going to be gone, that's like seven players that we don't want. or Not that we don't want one of those wide receivers that we have no, real, we have no realistic shot of actually landing. That means you have seven. I mean, we're going to get a top 14 player of guys that, like, could really be good at either offensive tackle or edge rusher or wide receiver. Like, so I wouldn't trade down too far because this draft's kind of going to work in Miami's favor with as many quarterbacks and those top end wide receivers going flying off the board early. Then you fix, then you're throwing someone like an alt. He's going to be gone. You're always going to have one cornerback go. You're going to have probably that. That offensive tackle from Oregon State's going to go. Like, we're going to get a really good player at 21. So I'd be really careful trading down there. But 55, all bets are off. You know, what? if you told me we can trade out of round two and get a pick in round three and four, I, I'd i probably sign up for that, honestly. For for me, if you're trading out of 21, you know, I agree. Don't trade too far out. I mean, if you trade back three, four spots, you're picking up a fourth-round pick, most likely. Um, which is fine because now you're picking up a, a round that you weren't even in. But if you're trading out of the first round, you better be damn sure that you're getting multiple, multiple picks. And don't even, you know, a team like, um, I'm looking at the top of the draft board, team like Carolina, team like Washington. You got new ownership. It's their his first draft. You think he wants to go to this draft after taking a quarterback at two? You don't think he would want to trade up to 21 and then grab a potential elite pass catching wide receiver to bring into Washington? You're you're gonna get their second round pick. You're probably gonna get 
either first another year. second round pick or even their first round pick next year in a trade back that far. So I wouldn't put it past Chris Greer to do something like that. You know, like you mentioned, the fifth year option aspect, you might trade out of rod one completely, but you don't want to go too far back and lose out on opportunity. But again, it's got to be worth it to trade out of the first round, right? If the Dolphins trade back three, four spots and you're still able to get Troy Fontenot, if you're able to get maybe, you know, uh, Powers Johnson, if you're still able to get a, a nice wide receiver or defensive lineman or whatever, and you're able to pick up a third or fourth round draft pick, you have to do that because you have to start backfilling this roster with cheap, young talent because the, the rent is due. Money has to be paid out. We saw just what happened last week, losing Christian Wilkins, losing Robert Hunt, guys you drafted that you could not pay because of the swings of the trades that you made for Hill, Chubb, and Ramsey. They got to find Christian Wilkins like talent in the draft. They got to find a Robert Hunt like talent in the draft. And to do that, you need draft picks. Trade down. That's just my deal. I'll say this here as we wrap up if they trade out of round one, Chris Greer has a lot of faith he'll be back in 2025. He's got no fear of job security if they trade out of round one because everyone saw this team sort of, you know, we've now made the playoffs a couple years in a row, didn't win a playoff game, but we're trending in the right way, trending to being one of those teams that's in the playoffs every year. At least now we got, you know, win some games in the playoff, but we're starting to trend in that way. And if he trades out of round one, where you've lost Wilkins, you lost Hunt, and, you know, all this stuff, it's like he's really comfortable in his role, this team. That's all I'd say. I don't care how well, he's been is. comfortable. Like, yeah, we don't need a first-round pick this year. We're good. We're good. Even though we haven't had one in the past two years, we can go a third year without a first-round pick. We ain't got no worries. That takes balls, man. It, it does, but, you know, he is comfortable in his chair because clearly – He should be. He's not going, he's going nowhere. He's not going anywhere, right? And, I, and, yeah. it, and regardless, I think of – I mean, if the year completely falls on its face and the team is so abysmal, abysmally bad that they can get fired, but I don't see in my head a scenario where the Dolphins get rid of Chris Greer or Mike McDaniel. If they get to the playoffs and maybe not win again, I don't see Stephen Ross making that move. I don't think only way they're gone. Up. What's that? Is if the only way they're gone is if it's like a three or four win season. Oh, a hundred percent. Hundred percent. That's the only way they're gone. Or if the offense goes from first to thirtieth. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's um, the only other way. I do want to bring a comment up in here. Someone has here, yep. real quick, because I understand his logic and I understand what he's saying. If the Dolphins sign this guy, Tom, I might be out. I take a flyer on Mackay Becton. Absolutely. He had injury. No, look, here's the deal, folks. Mackay Becton, and look, I understand the logic taking a flyer on someone who's a former first round pick. You know, was Jets had a lot of issues. No. <laughs> I'm out on Mackay Becton. This guy ate himself out of the league, ate himself off the Jets. The Jets tried everything. He did try last year, and he did lose a bunch of weight only because they told him, like, we're not picking up your fifth or option. You're done. And he's like, now I'm going to try and lose weight. Like, no, you don't understand. We don't care what you do. You're done. <laughs> and he tried, and he was terrible, and he failed. He was hurt again. This – it scares me because that's the name that Chris Greer, kind of like Isaiah Wynn, First round bust with his team that picked him. Nobody wants him. Let's go. Well, we, who knows? Like, no, those guys. Yeah, I mean, no, <laughs> they cannot sign Mackay Becton. I can't. I can't go through this. This team, you know, has got it has enough knuckleheads. Um, you know, and we're not. Hey, someone actually sent us a super chat type donation, so we got to answer this question here. Absolutely. Um, thank without, you for the super thanks, chat. Uh, thanks, Zach. Draft. Defensive tackle, first round, kind of what I said earlier. I'm on board with it. And, yeah. yes, here, this name is one, Byron, Byron Murphy. Murphy. Yep. I, I don't think he's going to be there, honestly. But if he I is think there. He goes in the upper teens. Yeah, I, I do too. If he is there, I'd pull a hamstring and send it in that card. Although, I don't think they actually walk him up anymore. Someone walks to them and gets it. You know what I mean. That's a guy that I would be all over if I am the Miami Dolphins. Someone who would like ease the pain of losing a Christian Wilkins, you can yeah. put uh, in the middle of your line there and, uh, you know, feel a little confident. Here's a guy who's going to be your five years, hopefully more. 
and we can sort of build around, put him next to Zach Sealer, be a big help. So, yeah, that position, like I said, in this show, I think is a big need for the Dolphins, and that would be a guy who would be, a, you know, a, from the football gods if he fell to the Dolphins at 21. But, yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, so that's all for today's show. Don't know if we'll be back tomorrow. Oh, I know tomorrow we got new show, Finn's Factor with with – Manny and Marissa, check that out on Tuesday. Bye. If there's any big news, I'll pop on and probably just do a quick solo show if there is. Um, I don't know. Also, there's going to be an episode of That's Another Miami Dolphins First Down with Josh and uh, with Josh and Josh with Josh Moser and Stephen D. Look at this, we got another one. Five dollars. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. I like your honesty. You know what? Not everyone does. <laughs> you should see some <laughs> of the feedback I get. Not everyone appreciates the yeah. honesty, but Jason. I like you, and I appreciate the five dollars. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Uh, now, again, I will, uh, we've talked about yeah. it a lot, and and Jason points to it. You know, the honesty. We're not here to sugarcoat things. No, right? I'm not here if to lie. Things are face. bad. If things are bad, it's going to be negative, right? If things are great, yeah. we're going to be very positive. We give it to you as it is. We're not here to sugarcoat you, and. You know, pee on your leg and tell you it's raining. You know what I mean? That's it. Like, we right. are going to be brutally honest with our assessment of this football team, and that's what we've always done. When Mike and myself, you started doing these shows together, that was the first thing that we said: is we are going to be honest. We are not going to sugarcoat things. We are going to tell people the truth. And it's, you know, everything is black and white. We're it's kind not of worked going out for to us. change. It's kind of worked out for us too. Yeah, um, we've done like, here's the deal. Like it, you know, there's, when we first started, there was like two dolphins podcasts, maybe three, if that. And we were one of the first ones to go every day. And I know when that, and I knew this, I go, when we go every day, you know, some days there's going to be a ton of news. Some days there's going to be a lot of news, but the only way this is going to work is to be, to cover this, you know, Taking your emotion. Look, clearly I'm a fan. For those watching on YouTube, look at the room I'm in. If you don't think I'm a fan, I don't know what Man to tell you. Man, he has a championship title, folks. I'm, I'm a fan. A championship title, which I've only touched when it come out when it came out of the box, and I will not actually touch again until they actually win an AFC East or something of consequence. That sits there untouched. So I don't touch because, it's as they say, don't touch the money. Um, so, so if we win like a game in September, who cares? I don't pick up the belt and go yeah, like an idiot. No, I will do it on this show when there's a reason to pick it up. Um, but it's like you, we're all fans, and you know, I got p- uh, feedback from the show I did last night saying you're so negative, and I want to say what is there to been positive about the past 24 years? <laughs> it's like we've won nothing, and it's like you see the same mistakes at times being committed over and over and over and over and over again. And am I supposed to just sit there quietly and be like, everything's going to be fine? It's like, no, it's not. Like, we're bringing back Jake Bailey and Danny Crossman. Sorry, I, I'm going to raise my hand and say, I have a problem with that. I don't think it's going to end well. I think we're going to have the same crappy special teams we've had this past three or four years. And I know some people, I know Sweet. for some fans, it's just, they're my favorite team. I never want to hear anything negative about my favorite team. And I get that. I don't like hearing stuff, you know, bad about my favorite team. But if it's true, I'd rather hear it from someone who also loves the team and not some random talking head on the NFL Network or Kyle Brandt or whoever. It's like I'm saying it because I love the team and I want to see them do better. And I think – I honestly do think this – you know, people think I'm nuts. If you sit by quietly, you're sending a message to the organization. You're okay with the losing. You're okay with the product they're putting on the field, which FYI hasn't won a playoff game since 2020 since in, well, they haven't won a playoff game in 24 years since the year 2000, haven't won the AFC East since one, I don't know, 2008. Like, why would you sit by quietly when you see, you know, failure consistently year after year? No, speak up and say, this is unacceptable. I want better. I want better. And as a fan, that's kind of how you should be. And I always say, Tom, we always say, anyone can fan how they want to fan. Want to be a blind-ass homer, live in a bubble, and think everything's always sunshine and rainbows? Go for it. You're a fan. If you want to be someone who shits on the team every day, go for it. Be a fan. But someone like me who might look at this stuff, who's not going to take every – you know, I saw last week when we signed Kendall Fuller, 
you know, Dolphins fans on social media taking victory laps. Oh, everyone said it's soft. Re it's Kendall Fuller, folks. We didn't sign Daryl Green in his prime. It's Kendall Fuller. And you put his numbers next to Damian Howard in 2023. They're essentially a wash. I mean, they're pretty much equal. I mean, I, I don't know what people think of victory laps over Kendall Fuller. It's like, what, what are you celebrating? Nice player. I'm glad he's here. Don't get me wrong. Um, might be a little better than Xavier. But if you actually look at the numbers, he wasn't. It's like, so, yeah, we're going to be critical with this stuff until they give us a reason not to. If they start winning Super Bowls or start winning the AFC East every year, maybe I will let a few things slide and maybe not open my mouth. Until we get there, though, I think it's okay to view this stuff critically yep. because they've given us no reason for us to give them the benefit of the doubt when they haven't gotten it right in, like, 24 years. Once. Yeah. No. It's the, you know, you got the baby steps, right? Win the division. Win a playoff game. And see where the chips fall. You just got to get to the dance and get the first win to just be in the conversation for a possible chance to play for the Lombardi. Dolphins haven't played for that trophy since, you know, 1984. So it's been a long time. Um, and, and hopefully, again, I, we use that word a lot. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully they get it right that they can push forward, challenge the Bills who have absolutely destroyed us for really like the last decade. You got to get by that team. You got to get by that monster at quarterback. They got to find a way to beat them. And once they can beat them and beat them convincingly and win the AFC East, then we've we, we got some positive things to build on. But as of right now, it's the same – Status quo things that we go through every off season, soft reset. You know they they spent the most money in free agency. You know those conversations are what they are. We enjoy those conversations because you know it's the NFL off season. This is this is fun. Uh, but when it comes down to it, they got to win football games. They got to get a. They got to find a way to win the division. They got to get a playoff win. I can't stand looking at them as the team with the longest NFL playoff drought for a victory in the league. I, I, it's it's terrible to look at, but it's been since 2000, folks. Something's got to yeah. change. Yeah, and uh, we'll see where it goes. You know, I see someone in our chat says that the Bills are weaker than last year. Yeah, so are we. That's a problem. So are we. The, so are we, we went through the same type of offseason. Miami may have looked a little different. They, they brought in uh, some different players. Buffalo hasn't really done a lot at this point. That's not to say that they won't, um, but both teams were in the same boat. They went for it, both missed. Now it's time and to retool. It's time Which to means retool. taking a step back a little bit yeah. and retool. It'll you know, be interesting it, to see what they do with Diggs. If I'm the Bills, here's what I'm they doing. they got to trade after June 1st. They can't yeah, trade. well, there's that. I'm on the phone with, like, Cincinnati and say, Higgins for Diggs. You have to throw in some other stuff, I know, to make it work. See if they can pull something like that off. I think for both guys, something like Diggs going to Cincinnati with Chase and Joe Burrow might make him a little bit happier. He'll have a chance to win. He might he might be a little happier there. And for T. Higgins, who's all about the money and stuff like that, maybe to go be a number one on the Bills probably make him very happy. I think that's a trade. Not that I'm trying to help the Bills any, but I think that would be a trade to help each side, honestly. And I wouldn't be shocked if that um, happens at some point or – if that's been talked about, at least I don't know. I have no idea if it's going to happen. Um, I just think it helps each side, and I think it would make Cincinnati really good, honestly. But I think they're going to be really good next year, anyway. So um, yeah, there's that. And one one last thing here, which I know we said we're not going to go an hour. We're probably going to go an hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the whole trade for Fields, which hit Pittsburgh to me, has said the best off season so far of any team. Like they've had the best week of anybody the past week. Pittsburgh. I, look, the AFC North is brutal. I get it, but they've had a hell of a week. And what they in that trade they made for Fields, I see Fields very much like Tua, not comparing the style of play, meaning they came into the NFL with no support around them as a quarterback. They didn't have very good weapons to throw to. They had the wrong type of offensive system in place for him. Tua was saved by Mike McDaniel, and look where he's sort of gone now the past few years. I think Fields, if he gets into the right system – with the right help around him, could have the same type of turnaround early on. So I think him, 
why weren't the Jets if it all if it only took like those late round picks? Why weren't the Jets all over Fields have someone in place to take over for Rodgers after? The, I mean, to me, I don't know why the Jets weren't in on that. Jets should have been all over that. Honestly, I know the Jets didn't have a pick around two, but it didn't take anything close to a high round pick to get someone like Fields. He's on a rookie deal. Right. You can pick up the fifth year option. To me, the Jets should have been all over Justin Fields, and he got you know one year with Rodgers and all the craziness that's going to bring. They're probably going to want to move on after this year from him. And then you got the next guy here and let's see what happens. I'm surprised the Jets weren't in on that, but I think Pittsburgh is man, They've had a good off season. That is it. That's, that's an organization that even when they don't have a great year, they don't fall that far. <laughs> like they're not great year is still making the playoffs or they're not great year is still winning like eight or nine games. They never have that like three win season or like two win season. Pittsburgh gets it right. And I loved what they've done. Yeah, they've. I I don't. I don't mind the moves that they've made. Um, for them, you know, obviously with any NFL team, it's about the quarterback. Russell Wilson comes in for nothing because the Broncos are picking up the tab this year. Uh, Justin Fields is going to cost them practically nothing because they didn't give a draft pick up this year, and they have him under contract for his fourth season, and then they can decide what they want to do with him. Do they want to pick up the fifth-year option? Do they want to give him a long-term extension? Obviously, that depends on his playing time. If they don't like either of the options, I have great news for Pittsburgh Steelers fans. None you can move on from both. Right now. Yeah. You move on from both, you get to draft a quarterback and start over on a rookie deal. I think it's the best. Uh, I think it's the best scenario. I, is it going to help them win this year? I don't know. It's a tough. It's a division. tough division. That's brutal. It's very tough division there. Um, but I think they got better defensively. They're going to be a tough out this year in the AFC, in my opinion. Pittsburgh always is. They don't have losing seasons. They just don't. Regardless of how happy Kenny Pickett and Mitch Trubisky are, they won nine games. <laughs> Who are the AFC North teams playing this year? Whoever got scheduled against them, like what other divisions got scheduled in 2024 against the AFC North? I want to say just... it's West. Oh. Let's see here, 2024. I'm just going to pick a team, Pittsburgh schedule. Yeah, because uh, you can just tell by that. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, come on. Okay, the Steelers will play. We know those teams. Looks like the NFC East. They got the ch -ch 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 Giants, Eagles. Yeah, Washington. They got the NFC East, and they got the AFC West. It looks like it's not NFC East. You know, you got the Eagles, Cowboys. If you get them at home versus the road, it really matters. Giants stink. Washington stink, in my opinion. Um, AFC West. I mean. Got to put up with Mahomes. Um, Chargers will be better, actually. Even though they got less talent, they're going to be better. And I don't trust the Raiders. Okay, So, AFC North, man, that's brutal. That's a brutal division. Yep. Brutal, brutal division. That's going to be a fun one to watch because they're going to cannibalize each other. <laughs> I mean, but as much as they will beat each other up, don't be shocked if they send multiple teams to the playoffs, you know, too, because they are that good, those teams. And they'll beat – these other teams and other divisions up. But everyone, thank you for listening. Um, everyone, check out the website, dolphinstalk.com. we got a bunch of new articles up, a bunch of new podcasts up, a bunch of content you're not going to want to miss. Follow Tom on Twitter at Dolphins Talk Tom. Follow myself at Dolphins Talk. We're going to have more shows this week. we got two new shows coming Tuesday. If there's a reason to have a third, I'll jump on and do something quick. Um, so check that out. And all throughout the rest of the week, we'll have shows. Thank you all for listening. And, folks, don't forget, we must put an end to highway profanity. Fins up.